You're watching Reason at Theology Live, a show dedicated to charitable discussions, debates, interviews, commentary, and analysis. The show concentrates on theological topics, historical matters, and philosophical problems with content ranging from introductory material to in-depth examination. And now, your host, Michael Lofton. And welcome back to Reason and Theology, everyone. Your host, Michael, on a Friday afternoon, joined by Andrew Bartell. We're talking about his leaving the SSPX and why he left the SSPX. But first, before we dive in, let me just welcome you on the show. How are you, Andrew? Doing very well, Michael. Thank you. Yeah, yeah it's good to have you on the show. So I saw your debate a while back. I want to say it was a couple months ago. I think it was on Pines with Aquinas. That's right. And then I also saw a video that you did with the Logos Project a few days ago, along with John Salza, who's going to be on the show um, sometime next month. I forget the actual date. Oh, um, but yeah, I was I was listening to your story and I found it fascinating. So I wanted to bring you on the show to talk about why you're no longer SSPX. So could you maybe give us a brief introduction to yourself? Tell us a little bit about your background. Sure. Um, so I was, um, I was born in uh, Texas, in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, both of my parents were in the military. My uh, father was in the Marine Corps and my mother was in the Air Force. That's how they met. My father was in navigation school and uh, they were both um, Pentecostal. They were both uh, in the Assemblies of God Church. And so I was raised in that for the first five years of my life. And then they uh, discovered Catholicism through Scott Hahn's book, Rome Sweet Home. And uh, they were talking with uh, another Catholic family that they knew on base. And the more they learned about it, the more they began to see the issues that they had struggled with in Protestantism and and see the beauty of the Catholic Church. And that led them to enter the Catholic Church while my dad was stationed in Okinawa, Japan, in Kadena uh, Air, Air Base there. And so that's where I was baptized. Uh, so after that happened, uh, we were in the church. Uh, we, dad, uh, dad got out of the military because our family was growing. Uh, we had about four kids at that time. Now we have a total of 10. I'm the oldest of 10. And uh, dad decided, we decided to move to Montana. He wanted to kind of get away from the busy military life, traveling all the time, settle down, um, keep having kids, kind of on a little bit of a small farm, which was where I was raised. And so it was during that time that my parents started having really negative experiences mm -hmm. in the um, the church at the time mm -hmm. and RCIA, mm -hmm. they started encountering strange and kind of heretical teachings from a nun who was directing it. They were encountering strange liturgies and they were wondering what they had gotten themselves into. And that's what began to lead my family down the, the route. They began being introduced to kind of Latin mass communities. At first out, it started off in the church such as um, FSSP communities and uh, adult parishes. But then eventually it led, we were eventually introduced to the uh, SSPX. So that was the start of um, our my family's kind of saga into the traditional Catholic movement. I was about seven at the time. And so, so yeah, so currently I'm working as a, a glazier. I'm a glass worker. I install windows and shower enclosures mirrors, different uh, custom glass projects. And um, I'm also currently attending uh, Holy Apostles College and Seminary, pursuing a degree in English and philosophy. And uh, I'm living happily in this beautiful part of Montana with my uh, wife and our three children. So tell us a little bit about your time in the SSPX. What exactly was that like? So it was, it was a very, um, I had a very happy childhood um mm -hmm. it was we had a very small close-knit community at mm -hmm. the chapel i attended and uh, all the people there were very wonderful um some of my best friends to this day uh are from that community just really wonderful people um it's very rural based very of course we're more kind of in the country more of a rural community and there's some really neat people 
um, the kind of people that, you know, drive horse and buggy, have horses, old cars, that kind of a thing. So I grew up in this kind of um, small farm environment. Mm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was very, very happy. It's where I received my first Holy Communion. Uh, and then the chapel where I went is attached to the Immaculate Conception Church out of Post Falls, Idaho. And it was there that I received my uh, confirmation from Bishop Bernard Ferlay. And uh, so, yeah, it was it was very, very good upbringing. I had a, a good instruction in the faith from my mother and father. The priests always preached really solid sermons. And um, things started to go a little bit south when my mom discovered state of occultism. Didn't go seriously south because uh, my parents believed that state of occultism was just kind of a different expression of traditionalist Catholicism, that they were united in their rejection of the Second Vatican Council and the errors and reforms that followed. And so it was pretty peaceful. My, my mom just held her private view, but we all still went to the SSPX. Uh, church. She wasn't part of uh, those state of conscious groups that say you can't attend SSPX masses because they're set in union with the Pope. She was more along the lines of the Congregation of Mary Immaculate Queen that said you can still attend the SSPX and have those sacraments. So we had this period of peace for the most part. And my dad was even open to state of occultism. And so that's why we had some state of occultist priests who would come and say mass at our house on the off Sundays, because we only had mass every other weekend. And, uh, we generally just gathered to say the rosary because, of course, you would never go to a Novus Ordo parish. And that that was when we started getting a bit in trouble with the, the SSPX pastor. Some of the other parishioners found out that we were having these state of contest priests and the SSPX priest said, you, you cannot go to these um, these masses are problematic. And he actually threatened to take away our key to the chapel and ban us entrance. So that was my first experience of kind of the infighting and kind of the prejudice that's even within the traditionalist community. But things really started to go haywire for me after I came back from France. I studied with the Dominicans of Avlier. It's a community that was founded by Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre. And I was there. I was a postulant there. I was also attending their high school. And it was there I was started begin beginning to encounter State of a Contest as well. So I, I had a few run-ins with a couple guys who had actually been discerning with the Dominicans as well, but they'd been banned entrance because of being holding these state of accountant's views. So again, I'm starting to see this. Also, I began to see more of uh, Bishop Richard Williamson. I was actually able to meet him in person when I was over there in France. And uh, it, it was at this time that I was beginning to hear rumors of like infiltration and compromise in the SSPX. Something was going on at the top. And then when I came home, uh, my parents started filling me in on everything that was going on. The, the, there were talks going with Rome. Bishop Williamson was opposing uh, the way that Bishop Filet and the superiors, the other superiors of the society were going about it, which eventually led to his expulsion from the SSPX, which was a big deal for my family because we'd always read his latest and comments and his letters and uh, really been formed by a lot of his teaching. And so my father really looked up to him and, uh, and then many other priests that I grew up with uh, and knew as really solid priests, like especially Father uh, Hugo, and uh, they, they started creating this SSPX resistance and arguing that the SSPX had actually been become unfaithful to the superiors of the SSPX had become unfaithful to the, the, uh, the legend and uh, the legacy of Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre. And so uh, they convincingly showed how the SSPX was beginning to move toward Rome and began to kind of cut down on some of the hardline rhetoric toward the Second Vatican Council and the Novus Ordo Mise. And uh, that's, that's when I came head to head with these issues, my parents uh, started having these these priests. We actually had a couple of these priests to say private masses at our uh, house. And I realized that I had a choice. I had to choose now between two different SSPXs. And so that was really one of the things that launched me into beginning to study my faith and decide, okay, um, where is the true church? Where can I find the, cat, the, the true remnant, if you will? <clears throat> Sorry, I had them unmute there. Let me ask you about something you said there. You mentioned um, a set of a contest priest. Um, 
how common is set of occultism among the SSPX? I know the SSPX rejects set of occultism. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm saying among people who attend SSPX chapels, how common is set of occultism in your experience? Well, it's it's one of those commonly held private opinions, and there are even SSPX priests now probably. Who, uh, who still operate within the SSPX, who probably have reservations and think that a state of occultism could be a tenable um, option. They just don't really believe in declaring it right away. Archbishop Lefebvre, when you, you can look at some statements he made that showed that he also believed that it could be a possibility. So you can find that all throughout traditional circles. So just because they attend the SSPX, doesn't necessarily mean that they completely buy into the official narrative of the SSPX. So there are a lot of people attending the SSPX, like my mother and like myself for a short time, who uh, came to embrace the theory of state of occultism while still attending the SSPX uh, chapels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing that I've seen, and I'm going to do a video on it in detail demonstrating this, but one thing that I've encountered from the SSPX is a rejection of certain magisterial teachings of the church. And the SSPX is very explicit about rejecting, especially third paragraph teachings, third level teachings uh, from the profession of faith. They're very clear about that. So there's an openness in their dissent against the magisterium. Is this something that you encountered or is this just only something that, you know, you just kind of see here and there? Is it out in the open? What was your experience there? Oh, certainly. Yes. It's, it's the commonly held view. And honestly, you would be ostracized um, if you did not adhere to the party line, you might say. Uh, if you don't, if you, if you go to the SSPX, if you attend the SSPX and you think everything's great with the uh, with the Second Vatican Council and the Reform Sacraments, you're going to be looked at as as quite the oddball. Uh, usually the two the two go hand in hand. Uh, I, I would say there, there was not a person that I met who didn't embrace the the teachings of the SSPX on this subject and believe also that the Second Vatican Council was faulty, that it was bad for the church, uh, probably heretical, and um, most likely heretical. The common view is that there are major heresies in it, and uh, and that the Reformed sacraments are actually harmful and destructive for your faith. That is that is the the view. There might be some people who, who maybe attend part-time and who don't run very much in SSPX circles, but they're definitely the exception to the rule. When you say harmful to souls... To be clear, and I've I've shown this in videos, but I'm just trying to ask you as far as your experience of how this is digested and expressed, you know, in you know in in the chapels. Um, you encountered this idea that if you attend the Novus Ordo, even when it's done properly according to the rubrics, that's harmful to souls. Am I understanding you correctly? Yes. No, you're you're absolutely correct. Uh, it was the the position held by Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre. You can find it in his open letter to confused Catholics uh, and other places. It was it also it's also the official position taken by the SSPX. You can find it in their study that they have published through Angelus Press called "The Problem of Liturgical Reform." You can find it in apologetics materials such as their uh, videos they put out on the subject, such as in their crisis series on their website, in the book that they've published, frequently asked questions about the SSPX, uh, and even in prayer books. You can find it in uh, well, their little blue spiritual warfare prayer book in the examination of conscience. Uh, you can actually find in there that um, there's a question that says, have I attended a Nova Sordo Mise? Have I attended the Nova Sordo Mass? So it's definitely seen as something that will distance you from God. Um, if not, and, and put your salvation in jeopardy.
and again, not one that is, you know, filled with abuses, but just the actual thing. Have you the attacked actual, it just yes. indiscriminately? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Even mm -hmm. in its officially promulgated edition in mm -hmm. Latin, mm -hmm. it's it's a Protestantized liturgy that will harm your sense of faith, your senses fide, and lead you into sin against God. Yeah, I've done a video recently on the disciplinary and liturgical decrees of the church and whether or not they could be harmful to souls. And so I'd refer viewers to that if they want to look further into that. But yeah, that's that's certainly concerning. Now, here's something that I've also encountered from Lefebvre, claims that Rome is in schism. Lefe Lefebvre will say, I'm not in schism. Rome is the one that's in schism. Is that something that you ever encountered or is that just kind of a one-off thing that Lefebvre said? Oh, ab absolutely. That That is to the accusation that the SSPX is in schism. That is the counter accusation. The mm. counter accusation is that we have maintained the tradition. We are doing what the church has always done. We're believing mm. what the church has always believed. And we are worshiping as the church has always worshiped. Mm -hmm. And it is the Pope and all of the bishops and the majority of the, almost all the bishops and the majority of the clergy and laity who have fallen into error and who are now adhering to a false conciliar church and the common parlance among all of us is usually nova sordo church because it's very intensely connected to the rite of mass right so nova sordo church it's that we identify it with what we consider to be the abomination of desolation in the sanctuary. Um, mm. There's that admission that, yeah, it's valid, but it's evil. So it's kind of an interesting thing where they say, well, yeah, it's a valid missile, but it's also an evil missile. It's a very strange position to hold, especially in the tradition of the church. And that's one of the things that I discovered when in my study of Michael Davies, when I stumbled across a talk he had given, I think it was on keepthefaith.org mm -hmm. that I studied, I, I stumbled across a talk he gave on the indefectibility of the church. And he referen referenced a book that he'd written on the subject called I Am With You Always. Mm -hmm. And in it, he argues that the Novus Ordo Mise in its officially promulgated edition is completely free of error and in, in faith and morals. And you cannot hold that it is harmful to your faith. And that just it just blew me away that he was arguing a position that disagreed with Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre. I mean, you don't disagree with Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre. You know, there, there's a lot of directions I want to go with this, but let me just maybe ask this question. You've mentioned a few so far, but what are some additional deal breakers for you? You know, it, what, what was it that you saw in the SSPX that you just thought, look, this is untenable. Um, I I'm, I can't get on board with this. This is a deal breaker. Yes, I think there were there were really three things that led to my ultimate exit, my my exit from the SSPX and state of occultism and the traditional Catholic movement in general. And uh, of course, there are elements of the traditional Catholic movement that are still operating within the church and who don't necessarily, you know, you can find traditional Catholics that won't reject the, uh, the Second Vatican Council or the New Mass. So there is still an element of that movement that is still operating within the context of the church. I think that it's currently struggling right now, but uh, but one of the things that led to my exit from the extreme uh, part of that movement, uh, the largest element of it, especially as embodied by the SSPX, was through my introduction to state of occultism. So many people are a bit surprised that it was through state of occultism that I actually discovered the errors of the SSPX. And it was from my background in the SSPX and their arguments against the state of a contest that I also eventually came to realize that the S the state of a contest didn't have the full picture either. I, I think that it's impossible if you study both the positions of the state of a contests and the positions of the SSPX or the recognize and resist position 
uh, it is impossible to take both of those seriously to realize that each one does actually have a chunk of the truth when it comes to the teaching on the church and the teaching on the papacy and the only way to be able to have the fullness that each one of these groups only have in part is to enter the catholic church it's the only way to reconcile the two if you really take both of them seriously the only way to reconcile them is to come back in full communion in the church and so it was through my study of state of Vicantism that opened my eyes and there was a prominent state of a contest known as Jerry Maditix, who gave a talk called Unauthorized Shepherds, why the SSPX, SSPV, CMRI, and other traditionalist clergy are not shepherds of Christ's church. And in it, he delves into the teaching of St. Francis de Sales' apologetic work on the subject in the Catholic controversy. Part one, before he starts getting into any of the other issues, he delves into do the minis do ministers, and he was speaking of Calvinists at the time, but it can be universally applied to anyone who is at odds with the Catholic Church and who thinks that they need to resist a reform. But he said, do these ministers have mission? And there, because there's only two kinds of mission. There's either mediate mission or immediate mission. Mediate mission is that mission that is given in the ordinary way through the Pope and through the apostolic mandate, through the bishops, through the ordinary structures of the church. It's that common passed down apostolic succession type authority that shows I can trace my line back to my bishop, back to the Pope, back to a, a continuous line to the successors of the apostles. That's the immediate mission. He also points to the Old Testament that shows that the appointment of Joshua by Moses is a type of this immediate mission. Then you have immediate mission, which is a mission given directly by God to in extraordinary circumstances to such as Moses or Christ or the apostles. It's a directly given mission, a directly given mandate by God. And that the number one sign that you know that someone has been given this mandate by God is the working of miracles. Moses worked these miracles, uh, Christ worked the miracles, the apostles worked these miracles. And that if they don't have both immediate and immediate mission, because the two go hand in hand. He, he showed that even those who have had immediate mission have always had a continuation of what went before. So Moses came out of the, the Jewish people and that line, Christ was also uh, came from the line of David. He also had a continuation of the mission of the Jews. So even those who have immediate mission he said that the two go hand in hand. And I realized that none of the clergy, that it was irrefutable. None of the clergy could show that they had this mission. And it's a matter of divine law. They like to go round and round about a lot of the details in canon law, such as supply jurisdiction, epikaya. None of that human law matters if you don't have the divine law in order. You can't transgress the divine law in this regard, because it actually have to, has to do with the nature of God and the divine constitution of his church. It's actually linked to the divine procession of persons. The father proceeds to the son and gives his authority to the son. And then the father and the son send forth the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit sends forth the church. Mission is linked to that divine nature. You can't transgress that. And once I realized that, I found out that, okay, I've got to re-examine my position because I've got to find the church that has this divine mission. I appreciate what you're saying here about mission, and I agree with it. But there's going to be some people who hear this and say, but look, you're telling me the SSPX is not in full communion, but the German bishops are? What would you say in response to that? I, I would say that's, that's a great point to bring up. Um, and we got into this issue in uh, my debate, my debate with Jess Kassman, the German bishops were brought up. And I was very glad he brought the German bishops up because the German bishops, even though there has not been a formal break or formal separation, are very obviously in a state of refusing submission in very important matters to the sovereign pontiff. And any traditionalist recognizes that. 
Uh, and my argument when it comes to the SSPX is that we just consistently apply the same logic. If the German bishops are very much in schism because of their actions, and you can recognize that, then you should also be able to look at the SSPX, even though in many ways they exercise, have been given the permission to exercise certain ministries in the Catholic Church under certain conditions. That doesn't mean that they are still in good standing. You have to look at their actions, look at their history, see what positions they're still holding, and see if that's consistent with the traditional Catholic understanding of the church, of the papacy, and of the exercise of authority. And also, many people forget that there is a horizontal aspect to schism. And I think this is probably one of the most damnable offenses uh, and the most obvious of the SSPX is not only do they refuse submission to the sovereign pontiff in very important matters, such as ecumenical councils and the promulgation of liturgies and certain aspects of canon law, canonizations, et cetera, et cetera, but they are also refusing to worship with other Catholics, even according to traditional rites. And refusing communion in a very important way, such as that with other Catholics, is de facto schism. There's no arguing with that. Yeah, I mean, the, the Code of Canon Law is very, very clear on what the definition of schism is. So my question here is going to be, well, didn't Pope Francis grant them certain faculties? How can you say that they're not in full communion with, when Pope Francis is doing such things? Yes. So... Um, Cardinal Raymond Burke, uh, who I've met and I deeply, deeply respect, uh, and I think uh, he is definitely an authority in the area of canon law, considering he was the head of the Apostolic Signatura, which was the highest court of canon law in the church. Uh, he has said that this situation is an anomaly. It's a complete anomaly. So it is a gesture from the Pope for the sake of those Catholics who are attending the SSPX so that they can have their sins forgiven and they can have valid marriages. It was a gesture of mercy. And the fact that he did it during the year of mercy, and he explicitly states it um, in the letter granting these faculties shows that that is the motivation behind it. Everything is still not hunky-dory. Otherwise, the SSPX wouldn't have to still continue to seek regular status with the Roman Catholic Church. That means everything is not right. Everything is not hunky-dory. So the church has a history, even though these are exceptions and it's an anomaly, the church has a history of granting exceptions for the sake of souls. So an example of this would be a suspended priest who might not even be practicing the faith anymore, who may have even been defrocked. The church permits him to administer the sacraments to a dying person in the state of a necessity for the good of that person's soul. That is not a reflection of the status of that priest. Obviously that priest has been defrocked, he's been suspended, and he's not in good standing with the church, but the church still, for the sake of souls, allows him to exercise that ministry. So it's a, you can see a little bit of that parallel in, in an example like that. So, Another question that I have here in your experience of attendance and well, you know, actually before I ask that one, let me ask maybe just one more follow up to this one. I don't want to beat a dead horse, but um, would you say as far as the issue of schism, are you saying that everybody who attends one of these services is in schism? Is, is that what you're saying? Or are you saying something a little different? No, certainly not. I am saying that anyone who embraces the positions of the SSPX and who buys into their narrative and into their self-appointed mission, you might say, and throws their full support is certainly in danger of schism. People who just attend SSPX chapels and who haven't totally bought into it, uh, their culpability is certainly reduced and they might not necessarily be into full bore schism, right? And that's why the uh, Hawaii case, which was uh, an excommunication of six Catholics in Hawaii was overturned by Benedict, this Pope Benedict, or uh, he wasn't Pope Benedict at the time, it was Cardinal Ratzinger. It was overturned because it did not constitute a formal act of schism. A 
just going and, and participate in the sacraments does not necessarily mean that you buy into the official positions of the SSPX as an organization. So you do have to take things as a case by case basis, uh, on a case by case basis. Basis. I can't talk <laughs> on a case by case basis. Um, so that's that. That's what I would say when it comes to that. At the same time, I want to make it clear that the laity are not without guilt in attending the SSPX, even if you do not em fully embrace their doctrinal positions. You are not without guilt when you attend their masses and support their ministries, because by doing so, you are enabling them to continue in their separate life apart from the one Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. If we laity held their feet to the fire and we left and they were not able to support themselves, they would be forced to come back to the Catholic Church. So we laity are actually enabling them to continue their separation from Rome. So we are not guiltless. And I, I want to make that really, really clear. And that's why I've been trying to speak to people, because if we hold the SSP, the, the uh, members of the SSPX feet to the fire and tell them to back off a lot of these uncatholic positions that they have received from their founder, Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, and repent of them, the schism of trajectory and separation from the church is going to continue. And it is going to become a permanent schism. So we, the laity, need to wake up. Yeah. Now, one thing that I've noticed in reading through the correspondence of Ratzinger and Lefebvre leading up to the illicit consecrations, um, it seems to me that Rome was bending over backwards to accommodate Lefebvre, I think in some ways that it probably shouldn't have. So again, I think they were bending over backwards in his favor. And I did not see the same thing from Lefebvre in his correspondence with Ratzinger. I saw the opposite. Um, but in his um, in his letter where he tell that is Lefebvre, where he tells everyone why the negotiations with Rome are off and he's going through with the consecrations, I got the impression that he then tried to portray himself as if he was just bending over backwards and it was just Rome who was so cruel. Um Whenever you were there at the SSPX, did you get the impression that the SSPX is just doing everything it can to be in a good reconciled state with Rome and it's just Rome who is not, you know, accommodating? What what was the impression like there? Yeah, certainly not. Uh, we, the position, and this is what caused the break of the resistance priests and the resistance of Bishop Williamson to the other superiors and to Bishop Filet was because they were departing from the status quo, you might say, or the position that we should have nothing to do with Rome until they return to tradition. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll certainly take anything that positive that they'll give us, such as the lifting of the excommunications or working with them in canonical courts, any way that they'll work with us according to our stipulations, then yes, we, we'll, we'll still hold hands with them in that way, but we still keep them at an arm's length. So there's this facade that you hang his pope, you hang the picture of the pope up in the sacristy, you say his name in the mass, you pray for him at benediction, uh, you pray for him, you acknowledge his authority as pope in theory, but then he does not have anything to do with the governance of the Society of St. Pius X. That's the superiors. If he was to make any kind of requests, we can refuse them. So the SSPX are the ones in the driver's seat, not the Pope. So we saw them, I know for me as a second generation trad growing up in the movement, I saw their picture on the wall and I said, Look, there's a bunch of modernists. There's a couple of modernist heretics that we don't have anything to do with. And we need to pray that they come back to tradition, that they come back to the true remnant of the church. That's that's the common boots on the ground attitude that you actually experience um, in in the SSPX circles. What was your experience 
in relation to why you noticed some people were attending the SSPX? What were their motives whenever you had discussions with them? Well, that, that varies very, it's very different. Mm -hmm. I would say probably one of the most common that we encountered is that they, there was, there was an attachment to the traditional rites of sacraments. And I don't, I don't like using that expression very much because I firmly believe that the reformed sacraments are also completely traditional, but as far as the old rite and the 1962 missile, most of them have a great devotion to this particular liturgical expression and they want to be there for that. Also, many of them have been scandalized by very poor celebrations of the reformed sacraments in parishes. Um, at least for those who are coming out are coming away from what we call the Novus Ordo church. And so they were clinging to what they saw as a uh, cleaner, more orderly, more reverent way of worshiping God. Um, and that would be the ones who came out of the Novus Ordo. There were, of course, all of the first, there were always, there were, there were the other second and third generation SSPXers who were, of course, there because they were raised in the movement and their parents had joined Archbishop Lefebvre uh, in his foundation of the SSPX and supported it. But then you have all the people who are scandalized by Pope Francis, who are listening to Taylor Marshall, who are listening to a lot of these you know, rad trad influencers, and they think that they need to have the traditional sacraments at all costs, no matter what. And so they find it um, often in SSPX chapels. And I would say that's the most common. Most people are there because they want those sacraments. They don't really get super involved in the politics of things. They embrace the position such as we reject everything that happens after the Second Vatican Council as untraditional. So they follow the SSPX in that way. But the people like my family, uh, where we really got involved in the in what was happening in the SSPX and state of Vicontism and the state of Vicontis priests that left and the resistance priests that were leaving and all of the issues surrounding Vatican II and the Reformed liturgy, um, we embraced everything whole hog. And I would say we're probably, um, we're, we may be more in the minority. At least that was my impression. Maybe it's 50-50. I'm not exactly sure. Did you say that some of the people who were in attendance there were influenced by Taylor Marshall and that kind of brought them there? Not not back when I was there. Mm -hmm. When I was in uh, the movement, Taylor Marshall was, I think, still mm -hmm. convert. He, he was just converting. I, I mm -hmm. can't remember when Taylor Marshall was received in the church, but I came mm -hmm. back into the church uh, about 2013. Oh yeah, so, this was before he went that direction. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. so okay. he hadn't, you know. So uh, during my time, it wasn't Taylor Marshall. Mm -hmm. uh, it was it was other influencers, uh, other magazines, um, other the works people. of Michael Davies, maybe. Absolutely, uh, yeah. Michael mm -hmm. Davies was definitely a big apologist for them. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I would say now it's very common to find people who have been listening to influencers such as Taylor Marshall, who are then especially since he embraced the SSPX. Um, that's definitely more, I think that's beginning, we're beginning to see more of that now. I uh, am asking everybody to send chat questions. Make sure to put them to at reason in theology. I'll do my best to get to them. Here's one for you from the Logos Project. Can you talk about the SSPX's perspective on the encyclicals and theological teachings of John Paul II? Yes, that that's definitely a, a really that's a, it's a really sad aspect of growing up in the SSPX was being deprived of the beautiful leadership, the beautiful example, and the beautiful teachings of Saint Pope Saint John Paul II. Uh, I have since come to just love him. He's such an incredible saint, especially for our times. Definitely one of the greatest popes in Catholic history, I'm completely convinced. Um, but we, uh, in the SSPX, we saw him as one of the most evil uh, men in the church today, which of course is why the SSPX adamantly opposes his canonization, because he truly was the Pope who implemented fully the Second Vatican Council, irrevocably. 
it was through his pontificate that he ensured the legacy of the Second Vatican Council and its implementation over every aspect of church doctrine and church pastoral practice. I mean, he had he had the longest papal reign after Pope uh, Pope Pius the Ninth, and through that long reign, uh, he was the one that cemented again the uh, post conciliar legacy, and he was also the Pope who oversaw the excommunication of the uh, archbishop and of the four bishops. So that's another reason uh, probably for the intense dislike. I remember encountering a cartoon which Archbishop Lefebvre uh, drew, which had uh, Pope John Paul II being summoned by two demons into hell. And that was definitely the common perception of him. He was the Pope that betrayed Christ. He was the Pope that did abominous actions and, um, and needed to be completely rejected. And we wanted to have nothing to do with his leadership. Yeah. Wowzers. I, I remember when I used to have that view. <laughs> oh boy. Um, okay. So here's something from Justin. Please explain how to respond to those who say you're either in communion or you're not. How can you only be in, partially in communion? Thanks. Uh, thanks. I hear a lot from this question. You know, this, this question is always interesting because the person who, who usually thinks of this on and off switch of communion has to assume the heresy of Donatism. That's ironic because <laughs> they're, they're fighting against the traditional view by trying to appeal to tradition, but they actually have to assume the heresy of Donatism. What are, what are your thoughts here? What are your comments? Anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I think the reason there's an issue there is because there is this false notion that thinks about communion in terms of quant just only quantity rather than quality. And I think the position that you can be either in full or partial communion is the realization and the development of the church's understanding of herself and the realize that elements of grace and virtue can be found outside the physical boundaries of the Catholic Church, outside of the juridical boundaries. So it is, and I think that's actually a more consistent view than the fact that, um, and it depends on the state of soul, of course, but I would say most sincere souls who are reading their Bible, say in Protestantism, there's going to be grace. And if there can't be grace, then how are they ever going to be led into union with the Catholic Church. There must be some way that God is working through his kingdom to reach these other souls who are outside the physical boundaries of the church. And I think it's rooted in scripture. Christ himself said, other sheep I have that are not of this fold. And that is a recognition of the fact that there are good, sincere souls because we're not angels and we can't know the truth just like that. We, for us, it's often a gradual process. So in our hearts, we are truly desiring and having union, uh, to have union with God and with his family, the church. But we still have these um, intellectual barriers or maybe emotional barriers if there was some kind of trauma, which keeps us from being in, in full communion. But that doesn't mean that these elements of grace and virtue aren't, can't be found outside the physical boundaries, but those also belong to the church. Mm -hmm. uh, the way it was explained to me was a Venn diagram. You have two circles mm -hmm. and where they overlap in the center. That's a really helpful way of understanding this uh, kind of conundrum, you might say, is that in the overlapping section are the people who are in that partial communion, right? They have, it's that invincible ignorance. That's where the development of full communion, partial communion comes from this, this, this teaching that goes way back about invincible ignorance, that you can have people who through no fault of their own are truly trying to pursue God and they can still be saved. They can still be a part of the kingdom of heaven. And, uh, and so you can find these elements outside the Catholic church, but they still, at the same time, it still belongs to the Catholic church. So even though it's outside of the physical confines, it's still within that mystical, spiritual body of Christ. Mm. Yeah, Father Thomas Guarino, in his work dealing with Vatican II, uses the analogy of a prime analog and a secondary analog, and, and the way that we can say that 
you know, a priest participates in uh, the ministry of Christ, and yet Christ is, is the prime analog of that ministry, yet ministers and priests are secondary analogs. It gives this idea of participation, and that's where we also derive this concept of participation in the church. It's that distinction between primary and secondary analogs. You know, I think that so, some of the people who have that, again, on and off switch would be shocked to read Augustine. I mean, Augustine <laughs> thinks that the Donatists, schismatics, and um, even heretics, but especially schismatics, that they're able, a Catholic, if they attend their services out of a case of necessity, is able to receive grace from their sacraments. Well, how is it that they can receive grace from the sacraments from schismatics? Well, it's because the grace is still operative in the sacraments, even amongst the schismatics. So um, that has to assume then this idea of participation. It's not the on and off switch. Otherwise, you would have to adopt Cyprian's heretical view that there's just no grace outside the formal bounds of the Catholic Church. Um, so let's see here. There's a good question from Catholic Gabe. Do you think one could make the case that Lefebvre wasn't culpable for his actions based on what was going on in his time? Your thoughts? It's a legitimate question. I mean, there was a lot of craziness going on. I mean, can we really fault Lefebvre? What do you think? Certainly. Uh, and of course, when it comes to Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, only God will be the ultimate judge of of what his state of conscience was. Uh, we have to leave that. Only, only God judges the internal forum. Um, for us, all we can do is judge the external forum. So even though it was a very difficult time in the church and Archbishop Lefebvre's culpability may, and I would say probably was even mitigated, uh, that does not mean that his actions were not objectively problematic. Um, so I think that what happened was, was that he lost faith in the church, especially not, not necessarily what he considered eternal Rome, um, because he had kind of this false separation between eternal Rome and temporal Rome, mm -hmm. but he lost faith that eternal Rome and temporal Rome were joined and that God would work through temporal Rome uh, to protect the what he considered to be a, a necessary, the necessary preservation of uh, the traditional sacraments and uh, the preservation of the faith in the midst of the crisis and the corruption. Uh, he, he lost faith in, in the unity of the eternal and temporal aspects of Rome, that the two go hand in hand. And because he lost trust in that, that sent him on the trajectory of being alone. And I think it's one of the things that actually led him to make certain errors in um, in the things that he held doctrinally and in the pastoral decisions that he also made um, that led to a lot of what we see now, the division and pain and suffering that are experienced within uh, the Society of St. Pius X, uh, because he separated himself from the rock that is eternal Rome, and he set sail on a lifeboat in the stormy seas by himself. And, uh, and so circling back, um, his uh, only God can judge his state of soul. We've had good men in the past, even saints, who have made mistakes. And uh, we should definitely take that into account. But we can't, because of his subjective state of mind, we can't say, therefore, his objective act actions were therefore justified. We still have to objectively look at what he did and see if that was correct. St. Saint, Saint Vincent Ferrer, when he embraced one of the false popes of the Great Schism, he was wrong. It didn't matter that he was an incredible saint and visionary. He was wrong. And so it's okay to still acknowledge that the archbishop was a good and holy man and he did great work for the church. And at the same time, see that he did things that were harmful to the church and actually inflicted wounds on Christ's bride, our mother, the church.
Somebody's asking for further clarification about Donatism, what exactly it is. I mean, in short, it's twofold. It was the claim that the holiness of minister is necessary in order for there to be a valid sacrament. So if the minister is not holy, um, the actual sacrament would not be valid. In other words, Christ wouldn't be present in the Eucharist of a minister who's immorally imperfect. Um, so that was one aspect of Donatism. And then another aspect was an assuming of the concept that uh, there's no grace outside of the formal balance of the Catholic Church. Um, so it's basically, again, that on and off switch when it comes to communion and the on and off switch when it comes to the validity of the sacraments. If you're going to recognize the validity of the sacraments outside the physical bounds of the church, you've already conceded that it's not an on and off switch when it comes to communion. Um, well, let's see. There was another question here. Uh, what do you think is the long-term goal of the SSPX? Are they just waiting for a traditionalist pope so that they can enter into full communion on their own terms? What's your impression there? Yes, I, I, I think that is the current line that's being held by the SSPX. Uh, the, the church, Rome, the bishops, there has to be a complete repudiation of what they consider to be the errors and the second vatican council uh, a repudiation of what they consider to be a protestantized liturgy a repudiation of false subsequent canonization such as pope saint john the 23rd pope saint pius the six or pope saint paul the six and pope saint john paul the second etc etc they believe that all of this is the church the church's embrace of modernism and until they believe the church has healed of that it it will still continue to be an us versus them they will not come back and uh, until those terms are met and that's why i'm calling on every lay person and for every lay person watching this if you have friends who are in the sspx uh, to challenge them to ask them to make an examination of conscience and to realize that we do have culpability in when it comes to the continuation of their separation from Rome. If we, if we hold their feet to the fire and we say, you guys have embraced these problematic doctrinal and pastoral uh, positions, and you need to come back into fullness of the fullness of communion where the traditional Catholic movement can actually blossom. And I know some people will say, well, it's not going to blossom under uh, Pope Francis because he is attacking traditionalist communities. Uh, one thing that I feel that a lot of people are not coming to terms with or recognizing is that it was because of this extreme element of traditionalism and this trajectory of schism and division that is leading to the complete and total suppression of the traditional, of the um, 1962 sacraments, because they are using it, they are abusing this mass as a rallying point against mm -hmm the Pope and against other Catholics. And, and so it is actually the fault of those in the SSPX and in the ex, even within the church and the extreme radical traditionalist uh, groups that are leading to the, the suppression of, of these rights. They've done it to themselves. Which is unfortunate because that then punishes people who don't have a schismatic mentality, but just yes. appreciate the form of the extraordinary form. And so it's, exactly. it's, it's unfair to them. Yeah, uh, which which is why I question, you know, whether or not traditionalist custodis is really timely because, and also prudent because, it seems like it's punishing some people who don't deserve that. Whereas we could just kind of punish those who do deserve it without punishing those who don't. Yeah. But it's a um, it's a messy situation. Yeah. It's it a really messy is. situation. Yeah. Um, so here's another one. What would your guess say to Pope St. Paul the sixth statement that Lefebvre has an inconstant mind? And this is related to another question where somebody was saying, well, didn't he sign all of the documents of Vatican II, which to my knowledge he did. What are your thoughts here? Yes, definitely. And it was that inconstancy and that vacillation between hard line and soft line that produced the same effects into the priests who became his spiritual sons. That's what also left, led to the biggest split in the SSPX's history in 2012, where they lost one of their bishops and, and dozens of priests, including whole religious communities, such as 
uh, my Dominicans of Avlier uh, to, to leave and break. Those were the hardliners. Those were the ones that were quoting Archbishop Lefebvre when he said Rome is the seat of Antichrist, that they are, these are bastard sacraments, bastard priests, that we want to have nothing to do with this conciliar church. That's the hard line. Then you had the soft liners, such as Bishop Fillet and uh, Father Schmidberger and a lot of the other priests of the SSPX who said, no, we still need to work with Rome. We still need to move toward them. We need to accept as much of the Second Vatican Council as we can uh, and recognize the uh, Novus Ordo Misi as valid and move toward the SPX. That was the result of the archbishops moving toward Rome, especially in 1988 when he was having uh, meetings with Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger and all the way up to the point of signing the 1988 protocol, which I would heartily recommend people go and read, wherein he completely recognizes the entirety of the Second Vatican Council, the entirety interpreted in line with tradition and the uh, reformed sacraments as completely legitimate. It's basically the position that is held by the fraternity of St. Peter today. And the priests of the fraternity are the ones who went along with that protocol that Archbishop of Five actually signed but which he reneged on and withdrew his signature on the next morning. Could you clarify whether one could attend an SSPX Mass to fulfill their Sunday obligation? What are some precautions one must take in in attending these Masses, if any? There's definitely confusion on this subject because from my understanding is if you're a Catholic, you should go to a priest in good standing. From the last I read on the subject is that unless you are physically or morally impeded to going to a mass that is within the normal juridical structures of the church, um, you can't go to the masses of the SSPX because their priests are still suspended in terms of saying the mass. So every mass of the SSPX is still illicit. That has never been regularized. And I would challenge anyone to go and find me a statement, an official statement from Rome that says that all of the masses of the church or all of the masses of the priests of the SSPX are completely regularized and all the priests are no longer suspended and forbidden, forbidden from saying the mass. I would challenge anyone to go show me that because you won't find it. So their masses are still illicit. And because of that, that makes it objectively a sacrilegious mass. So that's an abuse. That's just as much an abuse as a floaty raft mass in the, in, you know, in the ocean. Both are abuses. Just because one is clean and tidy doesn't mean it's also, it's also not being abused. So that, was, that would be what I would say um, with regards to whether or not you should attend you know, the masses. You knew it was going to come up, the issue of intention in a sacrament. If a priest loses belief in the real presence and therefore doesn't have an integral intention to confect the valid Eucharist, will the communion at his masses be valid? What do you think? <laughs> Absolutely. Of course, it'll be valid. A, uh, and, I mean, you can find this in basic catechisms. Uh, an atheist can administer the sacrament of baptism as long as he intends to do what the church does. And that doesn't, an intention doesn't necessarily mean that, well, I'm going to baptize this person to save their soul because Christ asked me to. The intention is just to be doing it. And by doing it, you automatically have the intention because otherwise you wouldn't be doing it. It's impossible to do something without the intention of doing it. So that's, and the, the SSP actually, actually argues this when it comes to challenges that, certain that come within the traditionalist movement toward the validity of um, Archbishop Lefebvre's consecrations, because there were some uh, rumors that were going around uh, mm -hmm. that the uh, consecrator was a, a closet Freemason and that he withheld intention. And therefore uh, Archbishop Lefebvre wasn't actually a valid Bishop. And the SSPX actually departed from the many ways that they say that it could be invalid because of the intention of the priest and the mass in the Eucharist. And they actually argued the correct 
church teaching on sacramental intention with regards to the consecration of Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, saying that as long as uh, Bishop Leonard came out vested in his vestments and, t- and doing what the church, going through the motions and doing what the church does, it is a valid sacrament, regardless of whether he withheld the intention. Because the church doesn't judge, it doesn't judge the internal forum. The church has to do with the external forum. If any, if anybody, can you imagine the havoc that that would cause if a priest could just withhold intention while he was baptizing somebody? Or oh, that would destroy holy them? orders. That would destroy everything. I mean, it, it would completely you, undermine the church. The you, church you wouldn't can, be functional. You I think never that, have all the records. Yeah, yeah, it would be a mess. Yeah, I mean, you you can never have confidence in anything of, well, was my bishop ordained by somebody who had the proper intentions 50 years ago? Well, I mean, was he before that? Did he have the proper intent? You can never have any kind of um, assurance of the sacraments. Yeah, it would, it would create an insane problem. Um, by the way, I remember you and Salza were talking about that in the video on the Logos Projects channel. So maybe y'all go and also check out that video where y'all discussed it in more detail, this issue of intention and the sacraments. I think it was helpful. Um, so let's see. There are some more questions here. Let me grab them. Do you, do you have a little bit more time? How are you doing on time over there? Sure. Okay. Go for it. All right. Uh, let's see. Let me just briefly screen some of these. You never know what somebody might type. <laughs> um, so here's one. What would help the SSPX? Oh, I think we, we did that one. Didn't we do this one already? What would help the SSPX rejoin Rome clarifications on the Vatican II documents? I think we did a similar one. But yeah, I think it, this it, one. It, right. Well, if you want to take a, a stab at any distinctions that you see in here, that that's fine. Yeah, I, I think that uh, definitely we can do our part as Catholics who are in full communion to help build up letter, uh, the, the liturgy, the reverence of the liturgy to contribute toward um, and to help our pastors to, to have more reverent liturgies and to do our part in the church, to live the example of authentic Catholicism and to build our local communities, but uh, in our local parishes, we certainly have a part to play in increasing the holiness of the church. That's why GK Chesterton said that the greatest scandal of Christianity are Christians. And, uh, and so we need to do our part to help show, show them the beauty that, that the reformed sacraments can be celebrated very beautifully, that, uh, that there is orthodoxy uh, and solid doctrinal development going on still in the Catholic Church. And so in our interactions with those in the SSPX, we can help show them and communicate to them this goodness that is going on within the church. Because when you're in the SSPX, and this is the danger of being in a separate life and a separate entity and not having a whole lot of interactions with regular Catholics and really just dismissing a lot of what uh, of the good that's happening in the church, is all you're focusing in is the bad. It's like a con- it's the confirmation bias thing. Uh, all you see is the terrible, weird masses that are being said. You think all the masses are clown masses, or you think, you know, everyone is a heretic or, or is, is uh, adhering to the heresies of, of the Second Vatican Council, and and uh, and thinks and and if you go and ask a, you know, someone in the pew that they think you should have women priests, right? Uh, being faithful Catholics can and and interacting with these traditional Catholics in the SPX can help them see uh, that there are, it is possible. It is entirely possible to live a full authentic Catholicism within full communion of the church. What happens to those who get married in the SSPX? Do they have to get married again? Uh, so if it was before the, um, extension of faculties by Pope Francis, to the priests, as long as they work with the local bishops, then then yes, you should definitely look into that. And uh, and by by talking to your parish priest, you should be able uh, your the, the parish priest in good standing. You should be able to see what you need to do in order to regularize your marriage in the Catholic Church. Uh, but even afterwards, after there are still priests who are not necessarily working with the bishop um, and who haven't been given permission. So even after the Pope has given faculties to the SSPX priests to witness marriages, as long as they do it in conjunction with the bishop, you need to look into that. You need to verify that they actually did that because 
um, in, in some cases, they actually didn't. So, um, so it's just something you really need to exercise caution. So I would certainly look into it uh, to make sure it's better to be safe than safe than sorry. Is the SSPX and schism similar to the Orthodox and Protestants, or is there a difference between them? Certainly. Uh, I mean, as, as Mark Twain said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it sure does rhyme. You can definitely see the similarities between the Protestant, the schism in Protestantism and the schism in the Orthodoxy. Uh, the, the parallels are very, very striking. Uh, as a matter of fact, a lot of the same things that the SSPX are arguing today just change a few details and it's almost exactly what the Protestant reformers and the Orthodox were saying verbatim. Just look up uh, some of the reasons that the Orthodox were giving for leaving and like the abuses they believed that the Roman Catholic Church was guilty of. Uh, and it sounds almost identical to what the SSPX um, are saying to this day. So there are definitely uncanny parallels between the two. So get immersed in history, look at some of these and you'll, you'll, you'll see, you'll see the, that, that it's very, very much the same. One commenter I think is misrepresenting you asking, are you saying that there's grace in Protestantism, but not in the SSPX? Can you comment on that? <laughs> I know I, I answered them in the chat, but evidently that was, no, <laughs> of course not. Of course there's grace. If there was no grace in the SSPX, I wouldn't have made it into full union. Yeah. Uh, and I can I can honestly identify multiple uh, phases and experiences that I had of grace that were the seeds that were planted that led to me coming back into full communion with Rome. And one of them I remember was the Dominicans in Avrier. We would stop by regular churches, even the hideously decorated modernist looking ones, and we would go in and make a visit to the Blessed Sacrament. And this was very new to me because before, um, and the, the Dominicans hold very hardline positions, but in this instance, they it was an acknowledgement that they believed that the Eucharist was actually valid in the majority of Novus Ordo Mises, although they did tell us sometimes to put a qualifier, you know, if you were there, Jesus, I worship you kind of a thing. But the fact that we were setting foot into regular Catholic churches was a different experience for me. And it was one of those first things that made me begin to say, okay, well, maybe we are still in communion and maybe we are still a part of this church. Maybe there is still Catholicism there. Um, that wasn't the majority, of course, of the practical life, but there are still these elements and these good things that the SSPX practices, traditional uh, devotions, traditional piety, um, very good cultural, uh, traditional cultural practices that are very good and are definitely growing souls. So of course, it, you know, I'm, I'm totally consistent. If, if there are elements of grace outside the Catholic church, and I put that in quotations outside the physical boundaries of the Catholic church, then of course you can find grace within the SSPX as well. But that yeah. grace is supposed to lead you into the fullness of communion, into the fullness of God's family. You don't, you don't just say, well, I've got this element of grace. I've got the Bible as a Protestant, or I've got the traditional 1962 missile and therefore I'm good. You know, I can be, you know, I can have, I can have these heresies that I believe uh, about the, the papacy or about, you know, the, 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 the nature of the church and I can be just fine. We're all called to move toward the fullness of the truth that can be only found in this, in, in the Catholic church. Yeah, to me, I don't know who has ever argued that the SSPX doesn't have grace. To me, it just seems like a red herring. Yeah. Um, Giga Sniper, what does the SSPX have to say about natural family planning? Have you encountered their uh, teachings on this or anything like that? Oh, that's that's really hit and miss, honestly. Uh, I think they because they don't really they don't accept any of the teachings of the church, uh, or they hold a lot of them at arm's length after the council. So they generally revert to Pope Pius XII's teaching on this, and he called it periodic continence. And I believe they do. I believe they do accept that, um, but it is kind of hit and miss in the traditional Catholic movement because, again, you're kind of dis discerning for yourself what you 
think is and is not true. You're kind of afloat, if you will. And so there are a lot of convincing traditionalist authors, such as Solange Hertz is one of them, that argue that natural family planning is just Catholic contraception. And you, should, you shouldn't you should ever practice it whatsoever. That is actually a pretty um, prevalent view throughout traditionalist circles. So it's kind of hit and miss. It depends on the traditionalist and probably depends on the priest. Now there's a follow-up here from the questioner. They were saying, well, there if there's grace in the SSPX, you can't fail to give credibility to Protestants and not any credibility to the SSPX. But I'm not aware of anybody who's arguing that. It seems like our questioner here is very confused. Um, so um, there's some other questions here. Let's see. How do the SSPX view the Orthodox churches? Did you come across any thoughts there? They definitely consider them as schismatic. Yeah, they, they recognize that there are schismatic churches. Um, and they often, in, in the debate, Jeff Kastman brought them up to juxtapose the Orthodox uh, against the SSPX to, to say, well, there's actually a contrast between the two of us. And so this shows that we're not sch in real schism like the, the Orthodox are. Um, but one interesting thing I have encountered is that if you take traditionalism, the ideology of traditionalism, as far as a false representation of the rules of faith, if you take it to its logical conclusion, you end up orthodox. That's why many state of contests that I encountered, as and some SSPX as well, they take it to its logical trajectory, and they end up in the orthodox, because the orthodox have been traditionalist, and arguing the same views about tradition as a rule of faith, especially against the magisterium as embodied by the pope and the bishops in union with him um they've been arguing the same thing for a lot longer than the sspx have and they they say you know hey guys over here we've we've realized that the church of rome has been off the rails for a long time um why don't you just be consistent and come and at least you know come back to an apostolic church like we are you know instead of instead of hanging on to to rome to rome's false claims to infallibility and indefectibility Anytime we have these discussions, there's always a group of people who um, make comments and distinctions that are completely irrelevant to the point. Here's one of them. Paul, Mr. Bartel, you were never in the SSPX. Only the priests and seminarians are members. <laughs> <laughs> you knew it was coming, right? <laughs> yes, absolutely. What, yeah. say well, you, sir? <laughs> I appreciate people wanting to make distinctions. You know, I mean, yeah, distinctions are good. I love distinct, uh, distinctions. So, I'm all about them. Yeah, but only when, so that's only why, when they're significant and relevant, though. Right. That's uh, that's why I referred. I I refer to myself. I refer to myself as an adherent. I was mm -hmm. an adherent of the SSPX, and mm -hmm. you can say. I think you can totally legitimately say why I left the SSPX, mm -hmm. um, and that I was in the groups of the SSPX because that's what I was exclusively. What else are you going to say? Yeah, could, no, could you imagine but, me putting in the thumbnail why I technically only adhere to the SSPX and left an adherence <laughs> to? Could you imagine me putting that in? The <laughs> I guess so. So people just you know they don't they don't think about that. So uh, whatever. <laughs> yeah. um, so okay. <clears throat> With 70% uh, of Catholics no longer believing in the true presence of Christ, do the SSPX have a point when it comes to going to a Novus Ordo Mass? What say you here? Well, for starters, I wish people would stop circulating that 70% number because I, I truly believe that's no longer accurate. I think that's old data. That's old data. Um, so I think that the it's gotten much better in the Catholic Church with regards to belief in the uh, real presence. I know in my whole deanery and even in my whole diocese, that number does not hold water in the slightest. So definitely, you know, it's easy to throw around statistics, but statistics change and often statistics are old. So, uh, so definitely look into that. Uh, and also um, we have to be careful to not fall into the um, propter hoc ergo or the post hoc prayer. Oh, I can't, again, I can't talk. Post -hoc, ergo, propter hoc. Propter yeah. hoc. Thank you. Yeah. Fallacy <laughs> of saying because of this, therefore that. We can't say that the, the, the massive loss of faith in the Eucharist um, is a result of the liturgy itself, because there are so many other factors at play. There are cultural factors that were happening that were actually happening even before the Second Vatican Council. And also we have to factor in that 
the reforms were not implemented obediently. Many people had an agenda and were doing it abusively and did many of the things that the, the, the reforms were not calling for. So it's way more complex. And there are so many more factors that led to that massive rejection of faith in the Eucharist. And I actually believe that sexual immorality is a huge factor in that as well, because sexual immorality leads us to lose faith and reverence um, in the dogmas of the church. Just a few more. By the way, y'all can continue to put questions there in the chat at Reason and Theology at Gmail. No, not at Gmail. Reason and Theology. Um, I was going to give you my email there. Uh, don't send them to my email because I'm not checking emails right now. Just put them in the chat at Reason and Theology. So, um, and I do see a super chat. I'll grab that one too. But let me ask this one first. Do you think, or what do you think about people who say that Marcel Lefebvre is a saint? Um. I, I of course, still consider Archbishop Lefebvre to be a kind of spiritual father to me. I was formed by the priests who he formed. So, so maybe even a spiritual grandfather, you might say. Um, and I'm so grateful to the many good things that I received from him. I just, I always have to acknowledge that. And I truly believe he was a very saintly man, that he loved God, that he loved the faith, and that um, I think in his heart of hearts, um, even though he was very, he became very confused. And I think he surrounded himself with probably less than exemplary men. Um, I think that he was a deeply good man. Um, but I don't, I don't think he will ever be canonized a saint because those who oppose um, the successor of Peter, those who oppose the church, do they, they don't get canonized, even though they're very saintly men. That's an objectively, that's a, a, a grievous sin against Christ. So even if he's not subjectively culpable because of whatever mental factors were going on, fear, uh, confusion, whatever that is, uh, what he objectively did was grievously wrong. So he, he, will, he will not be canonized a saint. I think that should be fairly clear. Here's a super chat. Thank you, Ryan, for it. He says, can you comment on the SSPX's rejection of the novelties in the 83 Code of Canon Law, and why are they wrong to do so? So uh, maybe you could speak to this a little bit too, Michael, but my understanding is that uh, in the uh, governance of the church, um, especially the Code of Canon Law, which is really at the peak of the regulation of the church's life, uh, you can, you are bound as a Catholic to submit to those laws. Um, so you can't pick and choose though. And, and because it's a universal discipline, it's actually protected, um, by the church's, um, uh, infallibility. So it can't, it is, and it's, again, it's a negative. It doesn't mean that the laws are necessarily the best worded or that, um, they're complete or anything like that, or that they won't change with time. What it means is there's nothing in the code of canon law that that could be harmful to your faith, where if you implemented that code mm -hmm. uh, faithfully, that mm -hmm. it would be destructive of your faith. The reason the SSPX rejects it is because it, it, it uh, John Paul II implemented the reforms of the Second Vatican Council mm -hmm. into it and into mm -hmm. its practice, and they reject that. Mm -hmm. But it's a very good example to bring up because it shows one, how the church, how the SSPX is refusing submission and universal uh, governance, which is objective, de facto, active schism. Um, and it also, uh, it shows how they're not operating within the normal juridical structures uh, of the church. Yeah, and on a related note, I'm going to show tomorrow where they reject the profession of faith of John Paul II, which is a partial rejection of the magisterium. Um, so that that certainly uh, impacts communion. Um, let, let's see here. Uh, Omar asks, I began to feel very bitter and angry towards Novus Ordo Catholics when I attended SSPX masses. Did you ever feel like this? Of course. Uh, Novus Ordo Catholics, um, although you might recognize that there, there are good people there. There are people who have bought into the lie. That's what you believe. They've bought into the lie of the conciliar church. They want things to be updated. They want all these, all the heresies that fall followed the second in the wake of the Second Vatican Council, and so they're um, they're either um, malicious or just naive. So so yeah, you see them as part of that separate church. They're on the wrong team. 
Um, and, and that's what will happen when you refuse to worship with other Catholics, Catholics, when you don't interact with them very much, you see them as a, as a part of a separate church that holds to, uh, false teachings. You're going to begin to see things as an, as an us versus them kind of a mentality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's see, looking through here, uh, probably one or two more. Um, what would you say to the Latin mass groups that are being suppressed and are trying to form underground ways of celebrating the extraordinary form? And this is not necessarily those who are, you know, SSPX, but just regular um, Latin rite attendees for people who are in full communion. However, they're starting to say masses um, without the permission of their bishop and houses and stuff like that. What do you what yeah. do you say about that? That's how the SS, that's how it began. That's how the schismatic trajectory of the SSPX began, as they began celebrating masses against the will of the Holy Father. Um, and that is what it's that it's those. And as you continue to engage in repeated acts of disobedience toward the church and something you believe is right, you're no better than the liberals, the, the, the progressives, the modernists, those people who think that they can ordain women and uh, and and that celebrate masses or that they can celebrate gay masses um, both are a rejection of the authority of of peter and just because one looks cleaner and more faithful than the other doesn't mean that they aren't both displeasing to god and that they aren't both an abuse so even if the church was to take away with uh the the 1962 practice of the of the missile which it's which the authority of the church and the Pope is completely within his right to do that. If he desired to suppress the right and have the current form be the only one practiced by Roman Catholics, he's completely within the exercise of his authority to do so. That might be a great difficulty, a great challenge, a great cross. But similar to the example of the saints, especially Padre Pio, who were wrongly persecuted and wrongly um by the church, we should embrace that and pray to be delivered. If it is truly wrong, if and if and if it is truly an abuse uh, of authority, we can expect God to come to our aid. But we have to be faithful. You don't defeat evil with evil. You will not get what you want by doing something wrong, right? You can't. You will not achieve a good end by doing something wrong to achieve it. You will only achieve what God's will is for you if you do it within the means uh, that he has given you on earth, within the normal structures that he has given you on earth. And, um, and you can see this all through salvation history. He has taken away even good things. I mean, look at Abraham. He was even willing to make him sacrifice his own son and to put him through that test to see if he would be obedient. So often God asks us to give up even good things because what he wants is not sacrifice but this uh, of, of, of on the altar, but the sacrifice in our hearts. And that's why the scriptures say again and again that obedience is more pleasing and more fragrant to God than sacrifice. We have to, as traditional Catholics, we have to keep that in the forefront of our minds, especially as we're going through a challenging and difficult time such as this. Bully sends a super chat and says, what if he gets a ton of miracles associated with him? Would Rome consider his canonization? That is Lefebvre. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess we'll see. But uh, I, I feel like if there were, are going to be miracles, there should be some. But um, I, I, don't think, I don't think it's going to happen. I'm not aware of anybody who's ever been formally a Catholic and has left the Catholic Church. And I know some people are going to say that, well, Lefebvre didn't leave, but it, it sure seems canonically um, that there was some problems there. So at the very least, leaving full communion. I'm not aware of anybody who has left full communion after having been in full communion, who has then been canonized. Uh, Palamas and people like that are not good examples because to my knowledge they're never in full communion yeah. um especially an archbishop yeah. um and people people like to say well he'll be canonized just like saint athanasius because saint athanasius he continued to say mass and exercise his ministry even though he was excommunicated by um by pope liberius and uh i would recommend people look into don't don't go to michael davies narrative or the spx narrative about Pope and, and about St. Athanasius and Pope Liberius. They have a lot 
of historical inaccuracies, a lot of things that they get wrong about it. And one of the big differences was that Pope Liberius was uh, excommunicated him uh, through coercion. They were being severely persecuted. Didn't you cannot Athanasius say that about John Paul II. Didn't Athanasius defend Liberius? Absolutely. And Liberius is actually reverenced as a saint in many Eastern churches. Hmm. Uh, seeing if I find one more here, if you've got time for it. Um, all right. So if Dignitatis Humani is doctrine promulgated by Vatican II and the SSPX rejects this doctrine, how can they be in unity with the church if acceptance of doctrine is required for unity? And I think you can expand this to say where they reject third paragraph teachings from the profession of faith. Um, you know, does, does that mean that they're not in full communion? Yes, exactly. Well, there's three areas that you have to be, you need to be in union with the church, and that is faith, worship, and governance. And if you reject important teachings of the church, especially as expressed in, a, in an ecumenical council of the church, which is uh, at the, the top level of the exercise of the church's authority, then, um, then yes, you have a you have a very problematic position, and you do not have a true unity of faith. There is a serious separation there. Andrew, I appreciate you coming on and doing this. Thank you so much. I value your time. Thank you for keeping. Uh, thank you for staying a little bit longer. I know I kept you over, but I really, really appreciate it. You're always welcome on the show. Any other time you'd like to come on. All right. Thanks so much, Michael. It's been a pleasure. Put in a plug for anything you want to make the viewers aware of. Oh, sure. Um, if people want to hear more about on this subject, get in a little bit more into the details, please uh, tune in to the Logos Project. Um, I don't, you won't find me on any social media platforms or anything, but you'll, uh, you'll generally find me working with my friend, uh, my friend Dom over at the Logos Project, which you could find on the social media platforms and on YouTube. So uh, please go check out and subscribe to his channel. Thanks so much once again for coming on. And thank you all for watching. Hit that like button, subscribe button. Check me out also at patreon.com forward slash reason and theology. And by the way, if you want to get my course on the magisterium to help understand Catholic teaching authority better, go to maximusinstitute.com and you'll see my course entitled Understanding the Magisterium. All right. See you later. God bless. Oh, wait, before you go, I would really appreciate it if you would consider supporting this channel. This is my primary means to provide for my family, and it also helps me to produce content like this video. If you would like to support me, become a patron by visiting patreon.com forward slash reason and theology. You'll also get access to extra exclusive content when you become a patron. Lastly, hit that like button and the subscribe button, and be sure to leave a comment down below. God bless.